gaps are over. Or are they? We explore computational kindness with the author of Algorithms to Live By and an autonomous drone for humans will be soon flying through the Nevada desert. We will explore that and a whole lot more on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1530, recorded Wednesday, June 8th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by PillPack, a full-service online pharmacy that combines modern technology, convenient packaging, and personalized service to make your life easier. Visit PillPack.com slash twit to save $20 on vitamins and OTCs when you transfer your prescriptions. And by Trunk Club. Get clothes that fit and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again. Trunk Club will help you create the wardrobe you've always dreamed of with your own personal stylist. Go to TrunkClub.com slash TNT and join Trunk Club today. This is Tech News Today, the show where we tell you every single thing you need to know about technology today. Today, right now. Mm -hmm. I am Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. Whatever today happens to be for you, today could be today, the day that we recorded this. It could be tomorrow, in which case this would be yesterday. Mm -hmm. It could be just, three weeks from now. We, we don't be. judge. Yeah. However however you want to consume, enjoy, mm -hmm. listen, view, you you got it. You, you do you, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All now right. that we've done that, okay. Okay. whatever that was. <laughs> Recode reports that there is an app for that, but you're probably not downloading it. The app, Boom, is officially over, says Peter Kafka. And he's not just talking about apps from small independent developers either. Research shows that the average consumer downloads zero apps per month. So we're done with apps. It's over. No zero. more apps. Zero uh, apps per month. That seems kind of high. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, they say, you know, we people download Uber and Snapchat. Mm. Those are the things, the only things people are really downloading. Uh, this is sad news for us that, you know, you and I, especially, who we do on a, at least one other show, uh, devoted mostly to apps. <laughs> well, I mean, apps aren't the only thing that are slowing down here, right? It's, it's also smartphones. Smartphones, you know, are not selling nearly as well as they have historically. Uh, these are obviously intrinsically dis uh, intertwined. I just, I kind of feel to a certain degree, the ma a little bit of the magic's burnt off. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? For the last t however many years, this has been the crazy thing. Can you, um, can you believe all the things that this can do type thing? Mm -hmm. And I think now we're kind of at the point to where, okay, it's, it's that thing that we rely on. Yes. Uh, but do we have to always upgrade our phone every single year? No, because it's the one that we have still does the things we need. And do we all, always have to install all these new apps? No, we don't, because we have the ones we already use that we rely on every single day. And in the past, we've installed plenty of apps. And then we ended up using them for a couple of days, and then they just took up space on our phone, and we decided we didn't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, things have just matured so much in the past 10 years that I think, I think it, for anyone to expect that, this stuff would be, you know, lightning in a bottle forever and ever. Like, that's just way, way too much to expect. Life goes on. Yeah. I mean, they're declining 20% year over year. So you're saying that sounds like it, you know, it's expected. And then yeah. meanwhile, Facebook, which is the app that a lot of people use, 1.6 billion users, not necessarily app users, but users. I mean, it, that's a lot of people already using Facebook. Right. So it's at that point, it's hard. Uh, same thing with Apple. Like it, it's hard to find more people. It's hard to, for Apple to find more people to sell phones to. It's difficult for Facebook to find more people to download their app. Uh, we're done. Let's just call it a day. Yeah, I guess we can just uh, <laughs> go ahead and cancel plans for any future smartphone or app store. Uh, no, you know, our, our attention is tapped. I mean, it's, you know, it's a big reason why new social networks, just using social networks as, as a prime example, have a hard time catching any sort of movement, right? They take Peach, for example. Peach, mm -hmm. at least at least in the tech sphere, had some sort of, of, of buzz going at launch and within like three days had just fizzled out entirely because we've already spent so much time 
um, maturing our presence or, or or our usage of a particular app, you know, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it happens to be, that is really hard for any of these new things to to really kind of light anybody up to devote as much time and, and get it to that same space. We've, we've made our bets, you yeah. know, we've, <laughs> we've done that already. We have, but you know who hasn't like the teens, the teens. So sure, that's where and I that's think why, like, yeah. like take something like musically, you know, mm -hmm. which like we, you know, we were just like, where did that come from? Like that's suddenly huge. It's huge. It's the 10 year olds love the musically. So it's something like that that catches on uh, with young people. I think we'll probably have that unless it's something that's not an app. And I, I don't know exactly what that is. I don't think it's like VR because that's super expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. So I think, I think there, that's where people, if you're an app developer, uh, I'd say aim for the seven-year-olds. That would be a good bet for you. <laughs> it keeps getting younger and younger and younger uh, as, as far as Well, you have a seven-year-old, don't yeah. you? Mean, what, I know. What and is as she you're, like? As you're talking about <laughs> Musical.ly, I'm like, man, she would probably really love Musical.ly. I need to like, she would because she's it. she's way into, you know, listening to music and lip syncing and all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know if that's reason for me to show her the app or to keep the app from her because well, it could... might just be too much of a, a draw for her. But you're right. You're yeah. right. And, I mean, that's a big reason why why, mm -hmm. uh, why Snapchat it has been able to kind of buck the trend, right? Mm -hmm. Snapchat, what is it, five years old now? It's, which yeah. is kind of crazy to think about. I think of it as being newer than that. But, you know, it's one of the more recent social network-ish messaging platform things that's come along that has been able to still get that pickup. And that's because in the very beginning, they did target the younger audience, which doesn't have, you know, there's still magic there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, I think it's the people who've been living with smartphones for the past 10 years that are just kind of like, eh, whatever. I get my docs on it. I get my email on it. And I have these apps that I check. And that's mm -hmm. about all I do with it now. But the seven-year-olds still experience joy. So Yes, exactly. <laughs> the world is a peachy, you know, wonderful place in their eyes. They haven't been jaded yet. Uh, and also, by the way, this is actually a really uh, um, one reason why Google's instant apps initiative, I think, is is kind of a, a great great idea, at least in theory. And I can't wait to play around with it, which is the sense that if people aren't installing apps, developers still have the benefit of presenting their app to them because that might be the better way for that particular service or whatever to be presented on, let's say, a smartphone sized device. I might not want to install that app on my device and have it occupy space there all the time and then never use it. But if I happen to do a search result for BNH, you know, photo, and I end up getting the phone app version of it on my phone, it's like it's basically on demand app, essentially. And uh, you kind of get the best of both worlds, you know, and then maybe out of that you get conversion. I don't know. Uh, the last story ties in perfectly with this next one. Apple is gearing up for its WWDC conference for developers next Monday. And leading up to that event, Apple's SVP of worldwide marketing, Phil Schiller, is letting loose some changes to the App Store revenue model ahead of the event. They're saving time for other things during the keynote, so they're releasing this stuff now. Until now, it's been a static 70-30 split. Apple keeps 30% uh, revenues, developers keep 70. Uh, but a new change to the model is going to see Apple cutting its share to 15% if developers can keep a customer of their app subscribed to that app for longer than one year. So, uh, you know, beyond a year, if someone's still dedicated and subscribed to that app, that developer is now going to make a bigger cut. On top of that, subscriptions are opening up for all categories, including gaming. That's huge. And uh, I just think this is, I feel like, I feel like on this show and on All About Android, it's come up so often just that, uh, and particularly on All About Android, how developers of apps, you know, more and more they're moving to the subscription model. And that's basically because if you develop an app and you get a lot of upfront sales, that's great when you're getting sales, but now everybody expects, you know, forever and ever for you to update this app, which essentially at a certain point, you're basically working for free. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, that's not a great model for longevity for anyone who wants to make a business and a lot, you know, build their life around developing apps. So I personally, I think subscription uh, format is pretty great. If it's an app that you love, maybe you'll feel okay giving a regular kind of 
a regular fee for it. Yeah, I wonder and hope that people will. So right now there's, I mean, there's now three ways to make money out of apps. You know, there's the one-time fee. I'm going to pay 99 cents or 9.99 or whatever it is. Uh, or I'm going to have in-app purchases, which is great and, you know, very lucrative, but annoying to a lot of us. Yeah. Uh, or there's the subscription model, which in the past, a lot of, you know, a lot of subscription models in a lot of the internet uh, endeavors have not worked so well. Uh, but, you know, you have now Spotify and Apple Music and Google Play Music, uh, YouTube Red, um, a lot of ways where it's like, okay, well, maybe this is the best way for everyone. To me, it, it does seem the best way, a subscription. Like, I, you know, because we grew up, like, we would subscribe to magazines. We would subscribe mm -hmm. to newspapers. Like, we were used to doing that, and it worked, and then we went away from that. Uh, and I, I would like to see it come back. Yeah, I mean, I, I do understand the the idea or the thought the kind of rebellion against this idea is is around like I'm being nickel and dime to death on everything. Everything's a little subscription fee. I know for myself personally in the pro apps world, like on my my Mac at home, I've got a subscription, a yearly subscription, a software as a service style subscription to um, Digi Design Pro Tools. So you know, I pay I think a hundred dollars every year. And I'm always up to date on the latest version of Pro Tools. And when I write music, like that's in some ways, that's better than me paying three, four hundred dollars up front for this thing and then feeling the burden to upgrade it somewhere down the line. Uh, here at Twit, we have uh, the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud Suite, and that's kind of a software as a service solution for that. So in, in some ways, the subscription for software in, in this very way actually works really well. It'll be interesting to see if people are OK with that. Uh, br in a broader sense in the app ecosystem um, because, you know, well, I was going to say because we install a lot of apps, but based on the previous story, I guess we don't. We don't. I mean, that, I mean this is a, the, the two stories are so interesting because it's yeah. like, is this a uh, revamp of the app store too little too late? I mean, is yeah, it too late for a lot of developers? Because I think the subscription model is going to work with apps that people need, uh, maybe for work, and apps they really care about, mm -hmm. and they care about the developer, uh, and they trust that the developer is going to update them. I think that it's going to uh, really work for for those people. There are other big problems for developers in the app store. There's search, find, discovery. App mm -hmm. discovery is really difficult in the app store. I mean, that is in part why, like, we do shows on here are the greatest apps. I've tried them. I've looked at them uh, because it's really hard otherwise to find it. So, so they're kind of revamping that. Uh, now they're adding search ads, uh, he mm -hmm. said. So uh, that'll be a way to promote your ad, um, which is genius. Oh, wait, like advertise, you know, yeah, for right. my app. Uh, so I think it, I don't know. I would like for it to not be uh, too little too late, but I'm hoping that it's not, but it, I, I'm afraid it might be. I've certainly heard about the iOS app store that um, discoverability is is a challenge. And so hopefully the, the ad search, or sorry, the... Um, yeah, the, the ad search aspect of this, which is basically like developers will bid for a certain keyword or to have their app featured based on a particular search. There's one single ad that's offered up per search. So you're not like littered with a bunch of, of uh, sponsored ads, very similar to what Google does just in general, in, in search in general. So maybe that's a great way um, to kind of increase exposure. But in completely related news to this, Google has already been testing an 85 uh, 15 split with a few entertainment companies, according to sources, which I think is very convenient timing talking about like controlled leaks and everything. It's like, ah, Apple had the thing. We'll check it out. We're, you know, uh, going to go ahead and leak this at just this time. So very convenient. Uh, however, the big difference here is that Google intends to deliver on the split without the year of ramp up. So it would just potentially, if this rolls out, that would just kind of be the new split, split as far as I can tell. The fact that this is already in the works shows that Google will possibly roll this out sometime soon. They're testing it behind the scenes. So this appears to be a trend. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, the big, you know, uh, Snapchat isn't going to go to the subscription model. Uber isn't going to go to the subscription model. Um, Facebook You never isn't. know. <laughs> but, I mean, Uber, Uber is a service you know, that you pay for your rides and it's, yeah. you know, and we know we've talked about their bigger plan. It's about self-driving cars sure. and Facebook is their bigger plan is taking over the entire world piece by piece. And that that's advertising and Snapchat also advertising is how they're making their money. So they they don't, this isn't, you know, all these changes aren't going to help them uh, any, which is good. I don't think they need the help. Yeah. I just wonder, I, I think in any case, when there's desperation, 
uh, things that didn't seem possible before suddenly become possible. So you never know. <laughs> Moving on, our search queries hold all kinds of secrets, including maybe whether or not we are going to get cancer. That's what John Markoff says, writing about a new study in the New York Times. Microsoft researchers and a Columbia graduate student used the Bing, Bing searches of a large sample of internet users who had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, so they they figured out who they were that, that had pancreatic cancer. Then they worked backwards to compare their previous searches to find commonalities in hopes that they'd be able to diagnose the cancer and allow more time for treatment. Uh, this sounds very promising, but also could lead to all kinds of problems uh, when we're talking about our, our search results and uh, especially when it comes to personal information such as our health. Um, yes, it would be wonderful if it could help uh, prevent or can't not prevent cancer, but early detection, early detection of cancer. Yeah. But also, I mean, you can just see well, that's two steps away from the insurance companies getting this information mm -hmm. uh, from it leading to false positives, which would cause anxiety or, you know, it's the same. It, it reminds me of the debate over mammograms, like how often should you get them? Yes. Like some people say as often as possible, but it can lead to all kinds of things if you have false positives with mm. things like that. And, and just not to mention the cost. So I don't know. What do you think about this? Well, I mean, it, it reminds me, you know, it's just another example of how this would be incredibly useful, obviously, um, if, if, if it proves out. And I don't know how you tell the difference between, uh, effectively, between curiosity searches and specific medical intent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I guess that's the point is that if you have all of this data flowing in, at some point you can tell those, you make those subtle, uh, uh, you know, pick out those subtle differences and make a determination. But it just, it reminds me of just kind of the, the, argument that we hear regularly about sharing data, which is, you know, people aren't cool. Some people aren't cool with sharing data because they feel it's an invasion of privacy and other others feel like that is the privacy implications is a good enough trade off for the value and benefit that you get out the other side, out of the other side. And uh, obviously this would be a big benefit potentially if it could, you know, tell you like, Hey, based on your, based on your search activity, I think you might want to go see the doctor. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but it, you know, it just, it just reminds me of Minority Report, like the pre-criminal, yeah. you know, who it all can, also right. can tell us you're about to uh, commit a crime or, you know, just all those things. That mm -hmm. and My other big question about this is why are all these people telling Bing all these things? Why aren't they telling their doctor these things? You know, that, that to, me, to me leads to just the question of like the whole doctor-patient relationship is broken. If we mm. are giving more information to our search engine than we're giving to our doctor. I'd be, yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. I think search engines very just way more accessible. Yeah, to, there's more, to the, more data to, the rea to be reactive with. Right. You know, we've got a search engine in our pocket wherever we happen to be. And I mean, I, I know me we, with using my smartphone, all it takes is like a little blink of, of some idea and I'm pulling it out and doing a search on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's very easy to be super responsive in that versus like contacting your doctor mm -hmm. for, for every little thing. Uh, also, people like to self-diagnose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Even though they don't like what they see when they do. Right. Uh, so today's question of the day is, would you let researchers mine your search queries if it meant early detection for disease? So you can email us at tnt at twit.tv. Let us know what you think. Like, do you think this is a good trade-off for you? Uh, would would you want uh, this information not public, but given to some sort of organization, let us know and uh, we will hopefully read some of your feedback on tomorrow's show. Do you do you want to suddenly refer to uh, it as Dr. Bing? That's the question. <laughs> yes. Google's Project Fi is getting a new partner uh, network in U.S. cellular. Fi users will now see their connectivity to the MVNO, switching between that Sprint and T-Mobile. Sprint and T-Mobile were already partner networks before, uh, based entirely on which network provides the best connectivity for the user's location. Of course, the network still requires that you have a Nexus 6P, a Nexus 5X, or a Nexus 6 to participate. So that's kind of a big hurdle for, I would say, most people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, more, more connectivity is better. U.S. Cellular isn't, a, you know, a huge, um, doesn't have a, you know, is not nearly as big as the big four, let's just say. Uh, but I think any extra network into this kind of like dynamic switching aspect of Project Phi is better than not. So 
I think from what I read, uh, the other it was this Project Fi was great in big cities, uh, in urban areas, but now this will be a big gain for Oregon, Oklahoma, Nebraska, West Virginia, Texas, oh, and Maine. Point. So for those of you in those wonderful states, um, with those particular phones, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think we report on this Project Fi uh, news because we hope that this is the yeah. way that that it works in the future. We hope that you know that it, we can all have it this easy. Uh, with our MBNO. There was a time when Google Fiber was this tiny little isolated thing, yet it still was something that a lot of people really, really wanted bad, badly based on just how great it is, you know, what a great concept and how Google has done with it. And now that's, I mean, it's not everywhere, but it's certainly opened up to a lot more markets. So yeah, you kind of, you kind of hope that someday Project Fi will kind of open up and be accessible to all. Mm-hmm. Well, get ready for the e-hang, the drone for humans, the Chinese firm showed off their autonomous electric passenger drone at CES, and now Yi Hang is, uh, has reported that they have been cleared for testing in the Nevada desert. So let me be clear here. This is an autonomous drone that will carry a human, not a helicopter, shaped like a drone with a pilot. No pilot. No pilot. Mm. Takes off vertically, can carry a passenger for up to 23 minutes at an altitude of 11,500 11, feet going 63 miles per hour to your destination with no other input other than the destination. So no stops wow. on your human drone. So in the world of <laughs> autonomous vehicles, road vehicles, the passenger still has to be able to intervene at some point. It's interesting that in this scenario, I'm guessing that the passenger wouldn't. Like, is it truly just like, don't worry about it. I got it. Well, it's not. I mean, it's not like I'm going to fly me. I'm flying you now. (laughs) None of us are taking this to work anytime soon. They're just testing it in the Nevada desert. I mean, we reported uh, a few uh, months ago, I think, that they also had this idea that they were going to deliver organs. Yeah. Um, Uh, You know, maybe not people, just just organs. Yes. Lung Biotechnology actually contracted Ehang to buy around a thousand of these suckers uh, for delivering donated organs uh, between hospitals. Uh, They still have a bunch of roadblocks to contend with, as you (laughs) can imagine. No pun intended. They have actually no roadblocks at all. (laughs) That's right. Well, you would think they wouldn't, but they do. Uh, Still needs FAA experimental certificate uh, to fly. Also, FAA approval to carry passengers and a bunch of other exemptions and waivers. Um, to just based around the fact that it's automated as much as it is. So still some hurdles. Does, mm-hmm. does it work with hurdles too? <laughs> no hurdles I mean, you either. can fly over hurdles. <laughs> some clouds, some yeah. clouds still to some, bump into. Yeah, still some clouds to fly through. But <laughs> anyways. After the break, algorithms might be our enemy uh, in our Instagram feed, but we will find out if they can be our friends in real life. But first, let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron, the sponsor of this episode. Blue Apron's mission to make incredible home cooking, make it accessible to everyone. That is their mission while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients and building a community of home chefs like you. For less than $10 per serving, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high quality ingredients to make delicious home cooked meals. Each meal comes with step-by-step, easy to follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences and choose a delivery option that fits your needs. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental US. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranches across the United States. Seafood is sourced sustainably, beef is raised humanely, chickens are free range, pork is raised naturally, and regenerative farming practices are used for produce. By shipping the exact amount required for the recipe, Blue Apron is reducing food waste meal by meal. So whether it's Japanese ramen noodles, wild caught Alaskan salmon, or heirloom tomatoes, Blue Apron brings you the best. Blue Apron is not only supports a more sustainable food system, it supports happy and healthy families. Cooking together builds strong family bonds, and research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often. New recipes are created every week by Blue Apron's culinary team and are not repeated within a year. Cook meals like spicy Korean Korean rice cakes with snow peas and pea shoots or sweet chili ponzu catfish and green beans with coconut ginger rice. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Visit blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. 
There are a few topics that come up on this show on a pretty regular basis, and one, of course, is algorithms. Increasingly, they control so many aspects of our lives, our Google searches, our Instagram feeds, even our Uber rides. But what if there were a way for us to use algorithms to make important decisions in our own lives? I'm hoping our guest today can help. Welcome Brian Christian, co-author of the book, Algorithms to Live By. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So even though we're depending more and more on our smartphones and our computers, there's still so many decisions that unfortunately we still have to make on our own every single day. Uh, a lot of these seem like gut decisions, but you say that a lot of times there are provable optimal solutions. Can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, I think one of my favorite examples is the apartment hunt, which is <clears throat> painful, painfully relevant to those of us in uh, Northern California. Um, the basic idea is that if you're looking for an apartment in a sufficiently competitive marketplace, uh, you can't do what a what a normal consumer would do, which is you know look at a bunch of options, take some time, think about it, and pick the one that you like the best. Um, rather, each time you show up, say at an open house someone is going to get that apartment right away. Either you have to like force a check into the hands of the landlord right away, or if you walk away to get more information, uh, you, you don't have the ability to change your mind because someone else has snatched that place. And so what do you do? You know, how do you make an informed decision when the very act of trying to inform yourself uh, comes at the cost of, uh, you know, the, these opportunities passing you by and potentially the best opportunity passing you by? So how do you try to end up with the best place that you can? You know, I think our, our intuition in this case would say something like, you know, you need to look at enough places to get a feel for the market, get a sense of what's out there. And after that point, be willing to take whatever meets that standard. Um, and in fact, you know, this, this intuition of looking and then leaping is entirely correct. But our intuition alone doesn't tell us what the appropriate ratio of looking to leaping ought to be. And in this case, the answer is 37%. Uh, you should spend exactly 37% of your time, um, so 11 days if you've given yourself a month to find a new place, non-committally exploring your options. After that point, uh, be prepared to immediately commit to the first place you see that is better than what you saw in that first 37%. So here's a case where uh, this is not merely an intuitively satisfying compromise between looking and leaping. This is the provably optimal uh, answer to the problem. That's so interesting. So you should go your uh, and look around without your checkbook and not uh, trust your gut and just walk around until you've gotten to that 37 percent and then take the and first. And then take the very <laughs> next one, which that's a hard that's a hard cliff to jump off of. Right. Like uh, it's, it's a little better. Therefore, it's the one I want. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I think most of us who have faced this kind of situation, whether in the context of finding an apartment or in a driving context of, you know, should I pull into this space? Is there a better space? Um, there are people who have made the argument that this structure, which is called optimal stopping, also describes our dating life. You know, of do you do you commit to the person that you're with or do you do you walk away to, to explore your options? Um, I think any of us in these situations are caught between these two dangers. There's the danger of uh, settling for something when there's a better option out there. And there's the risk of holding out for this perfect thing that doesn't exist. And what you look at, uh, when, when, you, when you look at the math, you see that, um, in fact, this is just a legitimately hard problem. Um, but there are ways to find the ideal balance between those two things. And so in, in the, the classic version of the problem, that balance is 37 percent. Hmm. So, you, so you're saying uh, that you should do that for an apartment. I was my next step was like, should you do that when you're buying a house? Because that's the other thing. It's like this is the most expensive thing you'll ever buy. And it always feels even like up here in Northern California, like in Petaluma, it, it, it even feels like oh, you're just well, it's, it's the one that, you know, I have to get it before someone else does. But then right. you I think you just said you should do that when you're looking for a mate as well. <laughs> well, you know, take take the advice with it with a grain of salt. We do include some, uh, I would say, cautionary tales of scientists and mathematicians uh, going all the way back to Johannes Kepler, uh, applying this sort of logic in their love lives. With I, I think it's fair to say mixed results. So um, there are a few words of caution about exactly what assumptions you know we should be willing to make about uh, about taking a mathematical approach to our dating life. Um, but I think there's something to be said for this structure, the optimal stopping structure, um, as being something that is kind of a fundamental decision-making form. 
that comes up again and again in human life, where you're presented with a series of opportunities um, and you have the ability at each step of the way to either commit and be locked into this thing and not know what else is, is beyond or to walk away, but, but you pass up that opportunity. And so this is something, um, you know, it comes up in, in finance. There are the, the financial models that uh, exist around pricing stock options, for example, um, are based on the same math of like, you know, you're seeing a series of opportunities to, to sell this stock option at a given price. You can either sell, in which case, you know, it doesn't matter whatever prices come after that, or you can hold on to it, in which case you can't go back. And so, you know, one of the points that we make in the book is that there are, um, there are these classes of problems that we face in everyday life, whether it's looking for an apartment or deciding whether to go to our favorite restaurant or try something new or cleaning out our overflowing closet. Uh, we think of these as uniquely human problems, but, but the message of the book is they're not. They, they correspond to a, a set of, of some of the fundamental problems in computer science, which enables us to kind of draw on 50 or 60 years worth of work on these, the formal versions of the problems and see if we can't learn something and, and derive some real human wisdom and some human insight um, to make better decisions in our own lives. So no doubt, obviously, algorithms solve a lot of problems or have the potential to solve a lot of problems. And it's kind of, you know, it's a, just an integral part of what we think of in modern day computing. And it's the solution to so many problems. Why are people so resistant to them? I mean, Facebook, you know, brings an algorithm into its news feed. Uh, let's say an algorithm tells me, oh, you like all these different foods. So then you're really going to like this one thing. And mm -hmm. then I realize I don't actually like that, even though it makes sense on paper that I should. Like, why, why do people to some degree just not like algorithms then if they're so useful. Yeah, in some ways I would argue that that algorithms are kind of getting a bad rap right now, that, yeah. that the word almost uh, has this negative connotation when you see it in, in the press, um, which is to me ironic at some level because, um, you know, an algorithm is no more, no less than just uh, following a series of steps to make a decision or solve a problem. And, uh, you know, algorithms are much older than computer science. Um, we learned algorithms in grade school for doing, you know, long division, but we, we follow step-by-step -step procedures for everything from cooking to, you know, making stone age tools. So we argue in the book that algorithms have been a part of human technology since at least the stone age. Um, but I think there's a deeper, there's a deeper uh, question in what you're saying, which is why are we resistant to the idea of, you know, living algorithmically or using these sorts of algorithmic insights in, in making our own decisions? And I think one of the reasons for that is that we have this, um, we have this notion that what computers do is they, you know, exhaustively consider every possible option. They calculate everything all the way through to the end to... Uh, arrive at some perfect infallible decision that's this, you know, correct every time. And we think to ourselves, that sounds like an awfully robotic or Spock-like way to live. That, that doesn't sound like an appealing way to live. It doesn't make room for the kinds of things that characterize human decision-making, like intuition and, and gut instinct and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, what I, what I think is really critical here is that um, in the second half of the book, we, we look at uh, the computer science of dealing with what are called intractable or NP hard problems. Um, and there are classes of problems in computer science containing many of the most interesting problems in which this sort of exhaustive, deterministic, exact approach, um, you, you just don't have the luxury when the, when the problem is hard enough. And so you have to use things like approximations and randomness, and you have to trade off the cost of making an error against the cost of just spending more time processing. Um, and what you end up with are a series of uh, prescriptions and a series of techniques that, that do, in fact, uh, resemble something a lot closer to, to the way humans work when we're up against a hard problem. And so I think in some ways, um, you know, we can kind of bridge that gap. We can sort of humanize computer science um, and in so doing, uh, get a more realistic standard of rationality against which to measure ourselves. You know, it's not necessarily about doing infinite computation when we're faced with a problem, but it's about making these smart trade-offs. Let's talk about computational kindness. So when I normally email mm. guests, I usually uh, say, you know, we, we do this show every day, like any, any time uh, you want to come on, we would love to have you. Uh, so tell me what's good for you and, and explain why that's the wrong way to go about uh, making a request of someone's time. 
Yeah. I mean, I, so there's this concept in the book that we call computational kindness, which is that there's kind of this unexpected bridge from computer science into ethics, where if you think about the, uh, the way that we interact with other people as in some way imposing computational demands on them, um, then what you end up with is, is you can start to think about um, ways, of, ways of interacting with people that minimize the computation involved. And the, that sort of thinking goes against the grain of a lot of what we typically think of as good etiquette or being polite. And so in, in your case, you know, if you say to someone, um, when are you free in the next month? Um, mm -hmm. Well, there's a sense in which that's very polite because you're deferring to, you know, what's convenient for them. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you think about this as a scheduling problem, um, you are saying, here, you solve this problem. Um, you know, <laughs> we have this problem, it's on you. And you're, you're effectively passing the cognitive buck or you're passing the computational buck. Um, and computer science has this very developed vocabulary for um, kind of de defining and articulating how hard a problem is. And one of the canonical results is that uh, it's almost always harder to find a solution to a problem than to verify whether something is a solution to a problem. Um, and so uh, proposing someone a time and saying, does this work for you? Does this meet some sort of minimum convenience threshold for you? Um, is, is maybe less polite from the sense of giving them more latitude, uh, but giving them something really concrete uh, is just an easier problem to solve. And so in practice, that, that may actually be the way to go. So that's the same with the, the mate that you found after 37% of work. That, that's the same when you're, you're discussing with that, that mate that you finally found. Uh, what do you want to do for tonight? No, I don't care. What do you want to do? Right. Like the same, oh, same man, sort yes. of thing. <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. And so I think this principle of computational kindness gives us, um, puts an interesting wrinkle on, on the classic advice of conversational etiquette. And I think, I think it's, there's, a, there's a deeper truth there, which is that when we interact with other people, we, we want to kind of pool our utility with their utility, but we also want to do our share of the computational work. So let's move on to, to email. Uh, you know, it used to be we would make all these folders for our email and we would um, put, you know, put our email in, in a specific <laughs> folder so that they would be there. Uh, that uh, doesn't really make sense in terms of, uh, of algorithms either. Explain that. Sure. Yeah. One of the papers that, that we cite is this paper from, I think, 15 years ago saying uh, it's titled, Am I Wasting My Time Organizing My Email? And the, the spoiler, you know, here is, is yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, you are. Um, and the, the relevant principle here in computer science is what's called the search sort trade-off. And so the, the basic principle is that in computer science, the, the one and only reason that you would sort something is to save yourself time later searching through it. Um, but this leads to a very natural question, which is, are you spending more time getting organized than you will save by being organized? Um, and so email is a classic case of this, where manually tagging and filing and labeling all of our incoming email um, with every single message that comes in is just a huge upfront cost and it's a huge ongoing cost. Uh, and in practice, the amount of time it saves us when we're looking for an email is quite minimal because searching through email is so fast. And so this is a case where it's better to just let, let chaos reign and deal with it as a, as a search cost when, when and if that situation comes up. That definitely takes a little bit of reprogramming. Uh, but, you know, and I only say that from complete experience because I used to be like a, a habitual like archiver and, or, you know, sorter of all of my emails into a giant list of folders. And yeah, you're right. That process was not fun, but I felt like I needed to do it uh, for some future date that may or may not ever happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, now I just search it. And I hardly ever go into a situation where that doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes yeah. you think about like Google... The they know this. Like they're the they're the people that really like brought algorithms. I think I feel like to our life with search, mm. um, just with Google search, and then with Gmail and uh, Google Photos, the same thing. Like I will oh, never sure. tag a photo again mm. because right. um, I don't have to. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And I think, you know, it's it's funny because there's kind of a this moral dimension to being organized. We feel like this guilt of, or, you know, if, we're, if we have to search through some messy file folder or search through our messy inbox or something, there's this moralistic dimension that kicks in that's like, I really should be more organized. And I think a better argument is, no, it's a trade-off. You know, you either spend the time to get organized or you spend it in these sort of transactional things. Um and, you know, it, people don't necessarily expect computer science to come down on the side of mess. But, in fact, it does more often than not, or certainly in this case. Mm. Uh, there's so much in this book. I'll, uh, I want to ask you one more question uh, and then encourage people to get the book if they uh, find all this fascinating. Uh, the ebbing house forgetting curve. Uh, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is uh, it goes back to the very origin of kind of modern psychology, modern cognitive science. Um, uh, Herman Ebbinghaus was a, a psychologist in the 19th century who tested himself m- on memorizing these kind of gibberish syllables. And then he would plot over time uh, the, the proportion of them that he remembered and the proportion that he forgot. Um, and the, the relevant thing here in the context of computer science um, is this concept called caching. So in any computer system, whether your smartphone, your laptop, you name it, um, there's this notion of a memory hierarchy where you have these very fast but limited uh, you know, storage areas that are, that are referred to as the cache. And the, the critical thing is you can't keep all of the information in the cache at the same time. You have to, uh, what's called evict some of it back out to the hard drive. Um, and so for human memory, again, it's, it's a similar concept to, to this idea of, of the search sort trade-off, which is that we always kick ourselves when we forget something. Uh, but computer science gives us a way to articulate the fact that uh, f- purging uh, things from our short-term memory is, in fact, a critical component of how our mind manages to function at all. Um, and so then you can ask this question of, Are we generally good at forgetting the correct things to forget? Um, And there's this whole cognitive science literature since Ebbinghaus that says, in fact, yes, we're generally speaking, we forget the correct things that we should be forgetting. Um, And so that's a nice moment at which uh, the computer science literature around memory management and the cognitive science and psychology literature around human memory um, really intersect in interesting ways and and sort of inform each other in interesting ways. Hmm. So the next time I forget someone's name, like I should just think that it wasn't worth remembering? <laughs> uh, it, it's similar to this idea of the search sort trade-off where not having that person's name in your working memory has uh, sped up everything else that you've been thinking about okay. um, in ways that you maybe don't appreciate. So, you know, a certain amount of forgetting is in fact critical as we go through life in order to just kind of Stay, stay responsive and stay functional. So that's, it's just part of the trade-off that we make as we go through life. I think what this actually is, is justification of the fact that we live our lives searching Google now, whereas before we felt the need to, to memorize so many things. And, uh, you know, you hear that argument, right? And, and people always say, well, we're just getting dumber because now we don't retain this information. We search it. And no, we're actually just using the tools we have now to free up our brain for other things. There we go. <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> well, Br- Brian, thank you so so much for joining us. Uh, Brian, for Brian has you. written for Wired, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, so many other publications. He's the author of Algorithms to Live By and The Most Human Human. They're available on Amazon, IndieBound, iTunes, Audible, uh, if you want to listen to it. So many other places where you can buy books or buy them to listen to. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, up next, we asked you about your thoughts on voice assistance yesterday, and we heard from quite a few of you. So we're going to go ahead and check in on your insight there. But before we get there, let's take a minute to thank PillPack, the sponsor of this episode. PillPack's a full-service online pharmacy. It'll make you wonder why you ever settled for a traditional pharmacy. I have a pharmacy right down here. You want to see it? It's this box. It's got (laughs) pills in it. This is PillPack right here. With PillPack, you'll never have to wait around for your prescriptions. Uh, You'll never have to sort your own pills. See, it's all sorted for you. Or chase down your doctors for refills again. Their pharmacists take care of everything for you. PillPack uses advanced technology to sort all of your medications and your vitamins by the date and time for each dose. I can actually tear this right off, and you'll see right there, I've got the date and time for for my dose right here. You can also order inhalers, creams, uh, diabetes supplies, which come in refrigerated, easy-to-open packages. Shipping is always free, of course. 
Their pharmacists are available 24-7, so you can speak with them uh, from the privacy of your own home uh, or if you're on the go. PillPack has truly designed their pharmacy to make your life easier and have very quickly disrupted uh, the pharmacy industry. What's great is that PillPack's compatible with most major insurance plans, including most forms of Medicare Part D, and their service is free. That means that you only pay the copays set by your insurance provider. Uh, here's what you should do to check it out. Uh, visit pillpack.com slash twit to sign up now. It only takes five minutes to get started. When you use our link and you transfer your prescriptions to PillPack, you're going to get a credit for $20 worth of vitamins and OTCs. That's pillpack.com slash T-W-I-T. All right, so first things first, check this out. Back in March, an Australian mom uh, named Stacy Gleason discovered her one-year-old daughter had stopped breathing. She grabbed her iPhone as she ran into her child's room to help, but in the rush to help, the phone dropped out of her hands onto the floor. And as she performed CPR for her daughter or on her daughter, she shouted a Siri command to call emergency services with a speakerphone. Stacy was able to communicate with emergency services while resuscitating her daughter. The baby did make a full recovery as a result. Stacy actually contacted Apple to thank them, basically saying that this feature was a huge reason that her daughter was even still alive, um, which is it's just crazy, but that's, that's awesome. That is so cool. I love it. It's just an awesome story. So far, two uh, products have saved people's lives. Two Apple products have saved people's lives. Remember the Apple Watch? That yeah, that's right. That yeah. was last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there you go. So there's a, a, a practical real-life example of how these voice assistants uh, come in handy. Uh, apparently, before this, she said that she used Siri sporadically and that she just kind of thought it was a fun feature. And now, like, of course, it's always, you know, always on and active. It's interesting uh, to me that it was in her mind to use it, you know, because she only used it sporadically. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. Like, I don't know that I would have thought about that. I I don't. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, crazy things happen when a situation like that happens. And I don't know. Your brain just goes where it goes. You know right, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and apparently her instinct was to, to bring it along. But, mm -hmm. man, if that feature didn't exist, like, it, that really could have been the difference between life and death. Um, so this is a perfect segue into our question of the day from yesterday. We asked if you talk to your device. And in that question, it was more in, along the lines of in public. Do you talk to your device in public? Got a lot of responses, uh, quite a few, but we kind of edited it down to a few uh, good points here. I'll start with John on Twitter who said, I use Siri to reply to my wife's messages on my Apple Watch in the grocery store. I love that it's so specific. Um, <laughs> honestly, though, only when there isn't someone else in the same aisle as me. And this kind of, I mean, I, I identify with this completely. There are some times where I'm walking down the street and I wait until I pass, you know, cross the path of that ongoing person, pedestrian in front of me, because I don't want to be barking, you know, barking commands at my phone as we walk by and have them go, what is that guy doing? Right. I mean, that was all the, pro the promise of the Apple Watch was really like, you can talk to it. You can respond to messages. Yeah. I never do that because it's just like, Look it just seems... Uh, you, but you don't want to be Dick Tracy. No, so I don't. And so maybe <laughs> I don't know if it's talking in public or talking to your watch. Yeah. Uh, because I, when I do talk to Siri, sometimes I just pretend like I'm talking to someone on the phone and then no one. Yeah, knows. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's that. Uh, Neo on Twitter says, I've slowly observed more of my non-tech family members starting to use voice recognition instead of conventional means, while all my IT and programmer f friends won't even think of talking to any device. Uh, and he cites security and privacy concerns as a reason why they won't talk to their yeah. advice. His devices. IT programmer friends are the same people, he says, that are taping uh, taping up, you know, something on the, the webcam mm -hmm. or whatever. Post a note on the webcam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're very clued into the whole so, privacy So, yeah, so maybe, it, yeah, things. it's more of a privacy thing. Sure. Uh, on that line of thinking, Paul wrote in to say, I'm uneasy about telling Siri to, quote, take me home. Uh, in public because of the voice feedback reading out my address. I think some of the, this voice interfacing is a security risk. Uh, I, I would use Siri more often if she wasn't reading out personal data at Caribou Coffee. <laughs> um, I would imagine that extends to other places too, but, um, yeah, so I didn't realize that that was the way, the way Siri did it. If you say like, take me, you know, take me home or whatever, it reads out the address, like the full address to you. I don't know that it does. I mean, may, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, we, I should have tried that before. I guess, I guess it does for Paul. I've yeah. Never, um, I've never noticed that. I I've mean, never said take me home before to <laughs> Siri. <laughs> or to anyone. <laughs> take me home, Siri. <laughs> you had me at unlock. 
Um, I know with Google, I know with Google now, it does not read it out loud. Like I could say, um, okay, Google, uh, navigate home or whatever. And it just kind of kicks right into it. It says, okay. And then it takes you there. Yeah. Uh, if you, I know if you like label your husband or your wife or something, it doesn't usually say their name either. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. Mm. Uh, Susan says, I am somewhat self-conscious about talking to my devices in public. The only times it seems okay is in a crowd when no one's paying attention, but then crowd and background noise can be an issue. Yeah. Point, Susan. Okay. All right. Well, a little bit of that public masking mm -hmm. aspect. If there's a lot of people there, then you won't stand out talking to your computer. <laughs> I don't know. There's still someone really close to you and maybe they're going to notice. But who can, I guess the, the the overarching point is who really cares? Yeah. These are people that you don't know, but yet mm -hmm. we're still, you know, I know I'm still aware of it. Finally, Jason, I promise it's not me, uh, says, I use my Pebble watch to send quick voice to text messages all the time in public. It works great 95% of the time. If the voice to text doesn't work well, I will not repeat myself. If you never repeat yourself, you appear as a tech geek productivity star to everyone around you. If you do have to repeat yourself, you just look like a geek that should have sent that text message the old-fashioned way. And that is true, too. And I think that's actually probably a very big reason why uh, some people don't, you know, end up using these things is if you've ever done it, if, if the first time you ever tried to do it, it didn't do the thing you wanted it to do. And, uh, you know, I experienced this with like mobile payments with Android Pay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work 100% of the time. And so I'm way less likely to ever want to use it then because the act of using it and then using the old method afterward, after I try it a couple of times because I've devoted myself to it and it doesn't work, takes so much longer than just doing the old method. And mm -hmm. so I do that anyway. So I totally get this one too. I have one more to read that just came in. It's so cute. I have to read it. Uh, <laughs> Caleb says, I talk to Siri often uh, for timers, music, and the odd question. It can be frustrating though when I try to talk to my daughter since her name is Siri and our music what? stops. I know. What? I know. Well, I actually have a friend named Siri. Okay. Also, that's her given name. And I feel bad yes. for those Siri people. Siri is a name. Yeah. I do. And I feel bad for all Alexas and Cortanas. <laughs> but thanks. You know, Microsoft at least found a name that people weren't using that often, as far as I know. Maybe there are a lot of Cortanas. I, do, I don't know. I'd be very curious to go to one of those baby name sites yeah, and see uh, where Cortana sat mm -hmm. a couple of years ago yes. on the scale. I'm, I'm guessing very very low and out of mm -hmm. out of normalcy. And probably, I mean, I wouldn't do it now. After, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there's a Microsoft fan out there who would do it. Probably. Like, yeah, well, it comes from Cortana. a video. She comes from a video game, I think, right? Yes. Okay. I, I wish I knew which there, one. There is, yes. What? Halo. What? Halo. Thank there you. we go. Okay, thanks, Kara. <laughs> uh, TNT's fan of the day is Grey Wolf at Zod Magus on Twitter, who apparently watches us on his TV from all the way across all the room the over, over there. there. Uh, and honestly, though, it's probably the same size. Enhance. <laughs> uh, they, they, yep, that's you. I think. It's pretty blurry. I think that's me. Yeah, I'll trust you. That looks you. like you. Uh, or maybe that's, a, that's an algo, like a mach an AI that made our show. Like the oh, AI. Oh, reconstructed. That, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Reconstructed it. it. Like. That's why it's blurry. Yes. It's an approximation. We do not care how you listen or watch. Uh, just watch and listen or listen. Uh, thank you for sending that, <laughs> Zod. Uh, the Pooh Bear also apparently watches. <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. I feel, feel a little weird about going in on different parts of the picture, but uh, Zod did send it in. So, he did. You know. Mm-hmm. I, I like that's, Pooh Bear. That, that's what you get. <laughs> uh, is that a hoverboard no. or is that the Hyperloop? You will find out in a minute. But first, let's take a minute to thank Trunk Club, the sponsor of this episode. <laughs> Guys don't like shopping for clothes. And I have some news for you. Some of us gals don't like it much either. Now you can get men's clothes or women's clothes that fit perfectly and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again, thanks to Trunk Club. Just type in your measurements, share your likes and dislikes, and your personal stylist will help you look and feel your best with clothes that fit you perfectly. Some similar services try to send you off-brand clothes, and they don't even ever let you talk to a real person about, about any of the clothes and what you want. But Trunk Club is backed by Nordstrom's, which means they have the highest standards in quality and customer service. Service. Your stylist is a professional trained in all the brands Trunk Club offers, but there's so much more to Trunk Club than that. They will pick your clothes from over 80 top brands and ship them right to your door. Keep what you like, 
send back what you don't. Your stylist takes the time to understand your unique look. And if you live in Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, or DC, you can stop by one of the Trunk Club clubhouses to work with your stylist in person. Trunk Club is not a subscription service. Shipping is always free and you have 10 days to try on the clothes. Make a statement at that next big event on your calendar with a look that's handpicked just for you and your style. Get started at Trunk Club today. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. Get started today at trunkclub.com slash TNT. That's trunkclub.com slash TNT. And we thank Trunk Club for their support. So this just in, Cortana has never ranked among the top 1,000 names in America. Uh, it, I'm sure I could search all over the world. Maybe that would be the better way, but I, I did this on short notice. Siri has also never ranked among the top 1,000 names yeah. in America. And Alexa uh, peaked in 2006 with 1,433 per million babies. That makes sense. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, important information today at Tech News Today. <laughs> yes. Remember the Hendo hoverboard? It's the hoverboard made with engines that generate opposing magnetic fields to levitate and the one that skate legend Tony Hawk awkwardly spun around on in a video a while back. Its creators at Arc's PAX are offering up the HE 3.0 hover engine at $10,000 per pair. They say it's completely scalable and can be used to levitate a heavy box to, you know, all the way up to uh, like a large building. Uh, if it's scaled properly. Think of that last scenario as being kind of like a good line of defense against something like an earthquake. If you had a levitating building, that would actually be pretty darn handy uh, in that scenario. And uh, they're kind of targeting this at the Hyperloop uh, because that's kind of what these teams that are working on solutions for the Hyperloop are, are trying to figure out right now. Hyperloop One and the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies teams are both kind of, you know, tackling this issue, Elon Musk's idea of a Hyperloop uh, to, you know, send fast speeding, you know, rails that don't actually touch the track uh, to take both people and cargo from like San Francisco Bay Area down to LA, just as one example. Uh, this could be a great solution for that. Mm. I think it's pretty cool. Right. And well. I want to hover because apparently it, it looks unimpressive. Like when you watch the Tony Hawk spinning around in circles on the hoverboard thing, kind of like, oh, wow, that, that doesn't look nearly as awesome as I thought it would look. But apparently they say you, don't, you just don't understand until you actually ride it yourself. I believe it. Yeah. It just kind of looks, uh, I don't know. This kind of right. looks odd. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, at least it doesn't <laughs> explode like the hoverboards that don't hover. Yet. <laughs> Yet. There's something to look forward to. Uh, all right. I'm not going to get you a hoverboard for Christmas because I can tell you aren't that excited no, about hoverboards. No, just get me something else for $10,000. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'll figure it out. I'll, uh, I'll get back to you on Christmas. Okay. Tomorrow's guest will be Ian Thompson from The Register. And always looking forward to having Ian on but the show. But you are not going to be here tomorrow. Oh, that's right. I completely <laughs> forgot. I'm not going to be here. I am out because... Because school's out for summer. Uh, school's out forever. So I won't be here tomorrow. <laughs> he and Thompson will be here with Megan. And you guys are going to rock it because that's what you do. Right. And you'll be looking for my $10,000 Christmas present. <laughs> that's right. Start I'll be early. researching heavily. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can take part in the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. You know how to subscribe to our podcast. I know you do, but I'll bet you know someone who doesn't, someone who says, you know, you're telling them about how you learned that fish spit or about our robotic overlords, and they say, what? What's a podcast? How do I get that? Send them to twit.tv slash TNT or tell them they can subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, or they can watch on their Apple TV or their Roku. If you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, and Burke for running the words and everyone who helps us with this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. <laughs>